Well, thanks everybody for joining us for our fourth installment of Colorado History with Dr. Dwayne Vandenbush tonight. My name is Ashley O'Hara. I'm the curator at the Crested Butte Museum. And tonight I'll just start off again with a land acknowledgement. Um, the museum does recognize that we are guests on this land and historically Ute territory. Uh, we acknowledge that the Uncompahgre Ute and the Tabawash Ute were forcibly removed from this area um, due to the Bruneau Treaty. Uh, we hope that you will take time to visit our neighbor museum, the Ute Museum in Montrose, Colorado, uh, with exhibits that are in partnership with Co um, History Colorado, um, as well as our uh, State Historic Society. Uh, why will we can never do this history justice? Uh, we do include information in our exhibits here at the museum about paleo Indians of the Gunnison Valley, the Ute people, the Bruneau Treaty, and the Los Pinos Indian Agency that was located outside of Gunnison um, in our exhibits. Other ways to support indigenous peoples of today in the past is to go beyond land acknowledgements. Um, you can do this by consider taking steps towards allyship and reconciliation uh, by conducting your own research of indigenous groups that were forcibly removed that live, were on your lands um, in your own community by visiting local indigenous museums and cultural centers, reading literature from um, authors as well of indigenous writers. Um, another thing I'd like to point out is that we hope that you consider becoming members of the Crested Butte Museum um, or making a donation that supports this program and all the work that we do here at the museum and future programs um, you can do that by visiting our website at crystalbeatmuseum.com, or you can call us at the museum and I'll pick up an answer. <laughs> um, uh, we have walking tours still every Tuesday and Thursday at 9 a.m. Uh, we're still doing private tours on weekends, um, starting up for three people. Um, you can schedule those at your own convenience. Um, and let's see what else. This program is also being recorded, so these will be available on our website, crestedbutemuseum.com, and our YouTube page, usually um, by Sunday evening after um, they're broadcasted. And um, you can visit um, our Facebook, our Instagram page as well for updates, or you can sign up for our newsletter on our website, um, and we do list all of our events in our, on our um, newsletter. Um, I want to say thank you to our lead sponsors. Uh, Western Colorado University Foundation, uh, Bill Petros, and Bud Bush of Bluebird Realty. Thank you so much. Um, and we'll have time for questions and answers um, at the end of this program. So please post them in the chat. I'll try my best to go back and forth between the Q&A and the chat. Um, but until then, I will let it, let, it, uh, let it go, Dwayne. Thank you, Ashley, and uh, welcome aboard, everybody. We've got about 254 people registered now, so thanks a lot for uh, tuning in. Uh, we will have a trivia question at the end of the session, and uh, the book that I'm going to give out to the winner is Around Gunnison and Crested Butte, sponsored by Arcadia Publishing. Um, we also will have questions at the end or comments at the end. I'd be happy to answer any of those. Uh, next week on October the 6th, the topic is going to be a real exciting one, and that involves railroads in Colorado. I want to mention to everybody that uh, this coming weekend, uh, not uh, this week, but the following week, October 8th and 9th, is homecoming at Western. Football team is 4-0. The Rady Building is going to have a grand opening on Friday the 8th. And for those of you in town, I'm going to be giving a slideshow on the history of Western at 645 in the Rady Building. So hopefully you uh, have a chance to see a lot of the alums. And it's a 50-year anniversary of the 70 and 71 group that will be in en masse. So here we go. We're going to talk now about the precious metal mining frontier in Colorado. And you're looking right there at a great shot of placer mining in Central City. Gregory Gulch. Ever since the time of Christopher Columbus, way back in 1492, there have been stories of gold somewhere in the New World. The famous seven cities of gold, the Gran Quivira, the El Dorado, which means fabulous cities or area of gold. This involved bishops from Spain escaping the Reconquesta, the big fight between Muslims and Christians, coming to the New World and meeting Indians who lived in cities of gold. Spain thought that they existed somewhere in the Rocky Mountains of what today is Colorado. 
What was later called Colorado was relatively unknown and unpopulated prior to 1859. Only Native Americans, a few Mexican villages in the San Luis Valley, and a few re retired fur traders, and that was it. The Colorado Gold Rush of 1859 changed all that as 100,000 people headed to the Pikes Peak country to get rich. The following are the reasons for the gold rush, which was very overrated. One was the panic of 1857, a big economic downturn in the Midwest. Frederick Jackson Turner in his great thesis, Significance of the Frontier in American History once said, to get large numbers of people moving, you gotta have something expelling them, that was the panic, and something attracting them, and that were the rumors of gold. The second reason was bleeding Kansas, a civil war going on in Kansas between North and South. A lunatic named William Quantrill of the South killing 100 people in, Saint, in Lawrence, Kansas, and another lunatic, John Brown from the North, killing Southerners at Pottawatomie. People didn't want to be living in an area like that, so they said, let's go to the Western part of Kansas which is Colorado today. And then there were rumors of gold. And then Midwest advertising. A lot of these cities in the Midwest, like Omaha and St. Louis and Kansas City, pump the rumors so they could sell people wagons and tools to mine with. And then finally, there was a Pikes Peak guidebook written by a man named D.C. Oaks. Distances in this guidebook from the Midwest to Colorado shrunk by a half. Bridges miraculously occurred over rivers. Indians were friendly and there was gold under every rock. And people believed this stuff. And these are the reasons 100,000 were on their way. One year before the gold rush, a man named William Green Russell from Auraria, Georgia, who had mined in California, heard from some of the Cherokee Indians in Colorado who were off the reservation that they had found nuggets of gold in the western part of what was then Kansas. Russell came and led 111 men to Ralston and Dry Creeks near Englewood, and he found just enough gold to stay. And then after it panned out, he headed up towards the headwaters of the South Platte River, which was in where Fair Play is today or on top of a Hoosier Pass. John Easter and a party from Lawrence, Kansas also came in in 1858 because of a dubious story told by an Indian named Fall Leaf, who came to his butcher shop one day in, in 1858 and tried to pay for the supplies with a gold nugget. When Easter asked him where he found it, he said, well, we, we found it with Major Sedgwick out in what Northeastern Colorado is today. They tried to get Fall Leaf to go with them but he didn't uh, didn't appear but they went out anyway and they went out initially into the area around pikes peak in the fall of 1858 the two groups were together where denver is today and both constructed town sites on either side of cherry creek william green russell named it cherry creek because choke cherries were growing on either side of the creek the Kansas party started a little village called St. Charles on the east side of Cherry Creek. Auraria was started by the Georgia party on the west side. In November, a man named William Larimer came in from Lecompton and Leavenworth, Kansas to promote the area for Kansas. He took over the St. Charles town site because only one man was left there. The rest of them had gone back to the Midwest to raise money. Larimer changed the name of the St. Charles town site to Denver after the governor of Kansas territory, James W. Denver, and he hoped to get some patronage if he named it for the governor. Cherry Creek formed the boundary between the two town sites. But in October of 1859, with a lot more people coming in, the two sites merged and they took the name of Denver. Other mining settlements came in late 1858. Boulder, about 25 miles to the north, named because of huge rocks in the stream. Fur trader Antoine Janis started Laporte, up where Fort Collins is today, along the Poudre River, hoping to get steamboats up there by boat to supply the miners. Arapaho City came west of Denver. 
and El Paso City near today's Colorado Springs also sprang up. In the early part of 1859, one of the wildest rushes in history came as 100,000 59ers or Argonauts headed for the Pikes Peak area. They came by every means of conveyance. Some walked, Mormons pulled hand carts, some rode horseback, others had mules pulling wagons, and some to the dismay tried wind wagons, hoping to sail across the plains using the high winds. That obviously did not work. Four major routes were used coming in. One was the Great Platte River Road, which was the Oregon Trail and then deflecting along the South Platte River into Denver. One was a Southern route following the Santa Fe Trail from Kansas City and St. Louis and then deflecting before you got into Santa Fe coming south, south to north into Denver. The Republican River Route, which roughly came by today's Burlington and ran into Denver. And the most used trail and the most direct route was the Great Smoky Hill Trail. There are many dangers. It was 800 miles from the Midwest of Colorado. Indians were not friendly. Streams were swollen in the spring. And cholera, smallpox, and other epidemics ravaged the 59ers as they came in. Many had doubts about Pikes Peak gold. Mark Twain put it best when he said, a gold mine is a hole in the, mound, a hole in the ground owned by a liar. But you didn't have to have assuredness of gold to have people coming in. All you had to have was a rumor. And it was a great story told about this in the mining camps. Supposedly a miner had died one day, went to heaven. And everybody snickered because no miners ever went to heaven consorting with prostitutes and gambling and drinking, but this guy had been good. And he met St. Peter at the Golden Gates and he presented his pass. And St. Peter said, can't take you, we're booked. And the miner said, what the hell you mean we're booked? And St. Peter said, don't get on me. We had a big religious war in the Middle East and a lot of good people died and were booked. Miner said, I want a temporary pass. And if I can go in and convince one person to come out, I'm in. St. Peter said, hasn't happened in a million years. Nobody has ever arbitrarily left heaven. And the miner said, shut up and give me the pass. And St. Peter felt bad, never happened before. And he knew that nobody was gonna leave heaven. So he gave the miner a pass to go in, temporary pass. Four minutes later, 6,000 people left heaven following the miner out and they appeared to be in a fast hurry to get out. St. Peter grabbed the miner and he said, what the hell did you tell those people? And the miner said, what do you mean, what did I tell them? I just told us a big gold strike down in hell. And then the miner grabbed his knapsack and headed away from heaven. And by this time, St. Peter was hot. Grabbed the miner and said, where the hell do you think you're going? And the miner said, what do you mean, where do you think I'm going? Haven't you heard they got a big gold strike down in hell? The miner believed his own publicity. So all you had to have was a rumor to get people going. Out of the 100,000 who started out, half turned back after a few weeks. Of the 50,000 who got to Western Kansas, that's what Colorado was named then, half of them turned back. And of the 25,000 who got to Colorado, half of them left during the summer when they found out there wasn't a gold piece under every rock. So out of the 100,000 who came, about 12,500 were left in the fall. Many returned to the Midwest bitterly with signs on the side of their wagons, which said, in God we trusted and in Kansas we busted or busted by God or hang DC Oaks who began this damn Pikes Peak hoax. Luckily, however, some goal was found and three separate gold camps emerged. George Jackson, a veteran Georgia miner who had mined in California, knew about gold and found some up Clear Creek Canyon in January of 1859. He thawed the frozen ground by building a fire. Then he melted snow in a cup to wash out debris and he panned out a half an ounce of gold. He then went to Arapaho City and came back the following spring. 
and began Idaho Springs, where Idaho Springs is today. A second discovery was made on the western slope along the Blue River, and the great town of Breckenridge began. But the greatest discovery of them all was made by a Georgia miner named John Gregory in January of 1859 on a branch of Clear Creek. Following a gulch that ran into the creek, Gregory hit rich gold and excitedly declared, now my children will be educated and my wife will become a lady. And that's the area that Gregory was in and that's the placer mining going on. John Gregory had found a gulch that bears his name today, Gregory Gulch. And soon the great camps of Central City, and you're looking at Black Hawk very early right there, and the Vadaville sprang up. The area that he found gold in became known as the Little Kingdom of Gilpin and became one of the great old gold areas of Colorado. One other great gold area opened up. This one was along the Arkansas River in the middle of two great mountain ranges, the Sawatch Range to the west and the Mosquito Range to the east. Off the Mosquito Range came great gulches formed by water coming off the mountains over millions of years. Strayhorse, Evans, Georgia, Iowa, and California. And there, where Leadville is today, and there's a shot of Leadville in the 1880s, a great placer camp called California Gulch began in 1860. It was named by a prospector named Abe Lee, who in the gulch where he found gold, exclaimed, hell, I got all of California in this here pan. All of the early gold in Colorado in the 1860s was placer gold, and that's gold panning. An individual miner with a gold pan scooping debris out of the bottom of a stream bed with water in the pan, gently rotating it downhill. All the light stuff ran off, and what was left in the pan were rocks or pebbles, which were now taken out by forceps, and if you're lucky, black sand or gold, which was heavy and remained in the bottom of the pan. You then poured a little mercury in the bottom of the pan, which amalgamated or linked up with gold, and then you burned the mercury off. And what was left in the bottom of the pan was always called pay dirt. Shot, wire, grain, flour, dust, or nugget. Pure gold, free gold. Put in your saddlebags and ride away didn't need any smelting at all. That decade ended about the end of the 1860s when the streams were panned out. And now you moved into the second kind of mining in the 1870s, where the returns were greater, but it was a lot tougher to get the gold. And that was called load mining or quartz rock or that type of heavy mining, quartz or hard rock mining, or load mining, you're trying to hit the mother load. And that meant going deep into the bowels of the earth and bringing up a lot of rocks and debris and muck. And they used to say that good gold was 200 of the ton. Now gold at that time sold for 20 an ounce, $20 an ounce. Somewhere in that one ton of muck and debris were 10 ounces of gold times $20 an ounce equals $200 to the ton, and that was good gold. Your job, however, was to find it. And as we're gonna see in a moment or two, that wasn't very easy. There were many characteristics of the Colorado mining camps, and I'm gonna give you about 10 of them. Number one, they were urban frontiers. Whenever you put three or 4,000 people together in one spot, that's urban. We're not talking about farmers living 20 miles away from each other out on the prairie. Secondly, all mining camps lack self-sufficiency. They couldn't produce anything for themselves except wood. When they cut clear cut the timber, they didn't have that. And also meat, when they shot the hell out of the deer and the elk, they didn't have that. It took five times the number of miners in a mining camp to supply them. Thirdly, all mining camps had a speculative gambling instinct. There was only one reason why anybody would be at high elevation and cold weather and heavy snow, and that was a chance to get rich. And I remember one time I 
one of my cross country athletes asked me when I stopped at a store in Alamosa on a cross country meet, coach, why don't you buy a Colorado lottery ticket? And I said, the chances of me hitting it big are slim and none. And my athlete told me, well, coach, he said, you know, you can't win if you don't play. And the odds may be against any minor hitting it rich, but if you're not there, you got no chance. Number four, the extractive nature of mining camps meant that they led a very short existence. The more they succeeded, the more they committed suicide because the more ore they took out of the ground meant that there was less ore left in the ground. And when all of the ore was out of the ground, the mining camp died out. Number five, the mining camps affected the area around them. And when they died out, the residue or the supply towns remained. All the great mining camps of the San Juan, Silverton, Lake City, Telluride, Uray, they all died out. Durango didn't die out. All the camps up Clear Creek Canyon, Georgetown, Silver Plume, Black Hawk, Central City died out. Golden didn't die out. All the great mining camps of the Gunnison country died out, but Gunnison and Crested Butte didn't. They were the supply towns, the smelter towns, the railroad towns. They did not have all their eggs in one basket. The mining camps did. Number six, the short existence of mining camps meant that they had to solve problems quickly and pragmatically. We're not messing around here. When the miners came into town on Saturday night, they, they always drank a lot. And then on Sunday morning, they would have a trial of anybody accused of jumping a claim or whatever. And they tarred and feathered that person and kicked them out of town. And if he protested, one of the miners would say, Harry, get the rope. And they tell the guy, you either got two choices. Number one, get your ass out of town. Or number two, we're going to hang you. What's it going to be? The Animus Forks Pioneer at 11,200 feet once said this, there'll be no appeals from this court because this court is the highest court in the nation. Number seven, the mining court was, the mining camps were greatly influenced by the federal government. The federal government owned the land the miners trespassed on, set the price of ore high enough to where miners could make a living, paid for Indian protection, and subsidized stage lines and railroads. Number eight, mining camps were very intolerant towards Mormons. They didn't like Mormons having polygamy and four wives when miners maybe had to spend a dollar for a half an hour with a prostitute. They didn't like Chinese because that was a sign the mining camp was going downhill. They didn't like Mexicans. That was racial because of the Mexican war. And they didn't like Indians who lived on land and owned the land that the miners wanted. And lastly, failure was the one thing most common in mining camps. It was a high risk area. And the old saying was that a mining camp was a meeting ground for failures. No stigma attached to failure. Although gold brought in the first wave of people in Colorado, by the end of the 1860s, it was pretty obvious that the 1859 rush had been overrated. People were leaving. Gold production went down by a half. There was no way you could smelt the gold ore until a great metallurgist was sent in from Brown University to take samples from the Boston and Colorado Mining Company at Blackhawk. And Nathan Hill took them by horse to the Midwest, by train to the East Coast, three weeks across the ocean to the best miners in the world, the guys in Wales who've been working in the tin mines for centuries. If they couldn't reduce it, it couldn't be reduced. And they were able to reduce the gold ore onto a copper mat or a base. Six years later, Nathan Hill figured out how to get the gold off of the mat or the base saving Colorado's gold industry by finding how to smelt it. He became a multimillionaire and a United States Senator from Colorado. Couple of the great gold towns in Colorado territory now, 
We're Breckenridge in California Gulch, as we mentioned, but the greatest of them all was Central City, Black Hawk, and Nevadaville. Central City alone turned out $125 million in gold from its rich mines. Gilpin County, there's their Central City, Black Hawk area, turned out 300 million. Now let me put that in perspective. Gold was selling at 20 an ounce then. It's selling at 1900 or so now. 19 times 300 million, do the math. In the billions coming out of Gilpin County. Central City became famous for the first railroad in Colorado, the narrow gauge Colorado Central, which ran up Clear Creek Canyon. The famous opera house where the world's greatest singers, including Beverly Sills perform. And for the Teller House with its famous face on the bar room floor. Now I'm gonna tell you a little story about how stupid I am. 30 years ago or so, I had my class in the area and we're staying at Georgetown. And I got tickets for everybody for the Battle of the Baby Doe in the Central City Opera House with Beverly Sills, the greatest singer in the world, opera singer in the world singing. And I was tired and I wanted to go over my notes. And I didn't think I'd enjoy it anyway. So my class went and I didn't. The following year, they're there again, but Beverly Sills is not singing, but they're playing the Ballad of Baby Doe again. And I thought, well, for historic reasons, I want to see the inside of the Central City Opera House, so I'll go. One of the great experiences of my life, when I came out of that opera house, I was banging my head against the brick wall. Stupid missing a chance to see Beverly Sills the previous year in the Ballad of Baby Doe. Central City was connected to Idaho Springs and Clear Creek Canyon by a fearsome eight mile Virginia Canyon Road, better known as the Oh My God Road. The great writer Walt Whitman who was on it said, you don't have to be crazy to take this road, but it helps. Mark Twain once said, the only safe way over this road is on your hands and knees, and I don't know if that is safe. In 1870s, silver took over Colorado. Georgetown, named for the early prospector George Griffith, and Silver Plume, three miles higher up in Clear Creek Canyon, had high-grade silver in the 1860s, but most people were looking for gold and dumped it off into the dump. Now there is a law I want everybody to remember. There's Georgetown, and that is Gresham's Law, an economic law which says the dearer the metal, the higher the value. And the ratio between gold and silver is 16 to one. And that means that gold is selling at 20 an ounce, silver sells at a buck and a quarter an ounce, 16 times less valuable than gold because there is less gold found than silver. And that's why everybody's looking for gold and throwing silver off on the dumps. Three things had kept silver from booming in the 1860s. One was bad gold publicity. People had gotten taken on, on gold publicity and the gold wasn't there. Secondly, was a lack of a good smelting method. And thirdly, was inaccessibility. There's no saying that says gold is where you find it, but silver is in ledges. Silver was found at high elevation and in very difficult to get to places. But then starting in 1869 and going for 24 years to 1893, the silver frontier emerged along the Colorado mineral belt. It began in the North at Caribou in Boulder County and ran all the way in a southwest direction to Durango in the south. The famous Colorado Mineral Belt, 250 miles long, 50 miles wide, and every great precious metal mining area in Colorado history in that belt. Central City, Caribou, Georgetown, Aspen, Leadville, Breckenridge, Creed, and the San Juan, except one. And the one was the greatest of them all, Cripple Creek and Victor, outside of the mineral belt, an extinct volcano, and more about that later.
The discovery of silver brought thousands of miners into the mining camps, made Colorado a state in 1876, something gold never did, and was responsible for the railroads, the smelters, and the investors. The first great silver camp was Georgetown, located up Clear Creek Canyon, had the title Silver Queen. By the mid 1870s, the camp had 5,000 residents and one great silver mine after another. From 1860 to 1893, the mines of the Georgetown Silver Plume region turned out $200 million worth of silver when silver sold at a buck an ounce. Today, it's 17 an ounce. Do the math. 17 times 200 million. 3.4 billion by today's prices came out of the Georgetown area. The mining camp also had the famous Hotel de Paris, the Red Ram Saloon, and the Great Georgetown Loop Railroad, which you're looking at right now, and more about that in our next session next week in our railroad podcast. If Georgetown was the first great silver camp, Leadville was the greatest of them all. And there's Leadville on Harrison Avenue. Located on the Arkansas River, 11 miles from its head on Fremont Pass, the original name had been California Gulch, a placer gold camp of the 1860s. By 1874, miners had black bluish sand they'd been throwing away as they looked for gold assayed. And the report came back as high grade silver with a lot of copper, lead, and zinc. The man most associated with lead bill was Horace Tabor. In his store in 1878, miners changed the name of the camp to Leadville. After one of them said, to hell with all the other possible names, we got more lead here than anything else. Let's name it Leadville. And it was named Leadville in 1878 with Tabor as the first mayor. On August the 20th, 1878, Horace Tabor grubstaked two friends, Augie Reese and George Hook, for one third of what they might find. While his back was turned, the two men stole a bottle of whiskey. They left, they drank some of the whiskey. And then long before they got to the spot where they wanted to dig, a spot that Tabor would say that he had walked over many times with no interest. 10 days later, and 27 feet down, the two men found the Little Pittsburgh, one of the great mines in the history of Leadville. Horace Tabor got one third interest and he was rich. He used his money to buy the Matchless Mine for $187,000 and he made 11 million from it. He now began to build banks and opera houses. He also caused a sensation when he divorced his old faithful wife, Augusta, and married a young 28-year-old girl from Oshkosh, Wisconsin, who they said was beautiful, but a little plump and reputation not the best. And her name was Elizabeth, but everybody called her Baby Doe McCourt. Leadville in the early 1880s had 30,000 people, tops in the state. 14 smelters belt sulfur fumes into the air 24 hours a day. Streams were polluted with mining wastes. Trees had been clear cut, no sewage disposal. It was the most unhealthy place to be probably in the nation. And the cemeteries are filled with kids who never made it beyond the age of one and people who died all together in one year because of an epidemic. Leadville badly needed a railroad and finally got one when the narrow gauge Rio Grande won the Royal Gorge War with the Central Pacific, with the Rio Grande getting the route into Leadville and the Santa Fe getting Raton Pass into New Mexico. And the Rio Grande arrived in Leadville July the 23rd, 1880. During his first decade, 1879-89, Leadville turned out $82 million of silver alone. And I'm not counting the lead, the zinc, and the copper. When again, silver was selling at a dollar an ounce. 
82 times 17, do the math by today's prices. It was one of the top two or three mining towns in the nation. Leadville faded by 1893 because of the silver panic of that year, dropping the price of silver to 58 cents an ounce. It also was hurt by the pinching out of high grade veins, labor trouble, and flooding the deeper one, uh, one went into the mines. However, Leadville soon revived for a short time following the discovery of gold in the underground mines by John Brown. Brown induced a young lady by the name of Margaret Tobin to marry him because of his discovery. Margaret Tobin was from Hannibal, Missouri, came to Leadville in a buckboard with her father and brothers at age 15. She was a tomboy, but wanted to marry a rich miner for a better future. She found him in John Brown. No one ever called her Margaret, only Molly. And the saga of the unsinkable Molly Brown began. Molly Brown and Johnny, after they made a lot of money from the gold, went to live in Denver. They weren't accepted by the sacred 36 and then separated. John Brown was most happy in the Silver Dollar Saloon with a shot and a beer, a boiler maker, listening to a Western tune. Molly went over to Europe and visited, was accepted by all the rich people over there, and then got a trip on the Titanic on its maiden voyage back from England. And we all know the Titanic went down and Molly Brown restored order in one of the lifeboats by pulling out a pistol. And later on, the story was told in New York, and she became known as the unsinkable Molly Brown. A great heart, used her money to help miners in the Ludlow massacre, but ultimately died alone without any money in a seedy hotel in New York in 1932. The gold air didn't last long in Leadville and Leadville languished until World War I, when the United States needed a hardener of steel for that war which broke out in 1914. They found that hardener on top of Fremont Pass, 11 miles from Leadville, and the Climax molybdenum mine opened up. Leadville now moved into another great mining era. Climax molybdenum operated from 1917 to 78 turned out $105 million of molybdenum every year. It closed up in 1978, reopened again in 2011, and is still operating today. Leadville never really quit. Now, a little personal story. When Climax Molybdenum closed in 1978, I interviewed Stan Dempsey who headed Climax. And Stan told me that it was their own greed because Leadville then was producing 72% of the world's supply of molybdenum. And they let the price go up and up and up till it got to $32 a unit. Always before molybdenum, which is contained in practically every mine in the world, was thrown off on the dump because it was, wasn't worth very much. But at $32 a unit, every mine in the world began to mine the molybdenum. And a big surplus came, and the molybdenum price in 1978 dropped down to $2 a unit. And Stan told me it was our own greed that did it. What about Baby Doe and Tabor? Horace Tabor was ruined by the Panic of 1893, and with help from friends, worked for the post office in Denver before he died in 1899 at the age of 69. His last words to Baby Doe were, don't sell the matchless. And she lived on the matchless, quite insane and out of money, until 1935, when she was found frozen to death on the floor. The greatest silver camp in the world during the 1880s was the great town of Aspen on the Roaring Fork. And there's a great shot of the Maroon Lake and Maroon Bells just over Independence Pass on the Western Slope. Originally named Roaring Fork City and then Ute, Aspen had fabulously rich mines like the Molly Gibson. And Molly Gibson had a 3,300 3, ounces of silver to the ton. And the smuggler 
which produced a nugget 2,060 pounds, 93% pure silver. And there's the great town of Aspen in the 1880s. Aspen was without a railroad until the arrival of the Denver and Rio Grande in 1887 and the Colorado Midland in 1888. Prior to that, there's a shot of the uh, Camp Bird Mine. We're a little early on that, but you keep it up there, Ashley. Prior to that, long burrow trains of 500 to 1,000 animals carry 200 pounds of ore from Aspen on their backs to the nearest railhead at Crested Butte, coming over 11,800 foot high East Maroon Pass through Gothic and then the railhead at Crested Butte. On the return trip, the burrows called Rocky Mountain Canaries carried back needed supplies for that booming mining camp. By the late 1880s, Aspen had 11,000 people, six newspapers, 10 daily passenger trains, 40 saloons, and the famous Hotel Jerome and the Wheeler Opera House. It got a railroad with the Rio Grande in 87 and the Colorado Midland in 88. From 1880 to 1890, the mines of Aspen turned out $100 million worth of silver with 1.7 billion by today's standards. The Panic of 1893 marked the end of Aspen as a great silver town. Population fell from 11,000 to 700, and the good times were all gone until Aspen rediscovered itself as a great ski town with the boat tow of 1938, Chair One, 1946, and then Ajax, Highland, Snowmass, and Buttermilk, the four great areas of today. One of the richest gold and silver areas in Colorado and the U.S. was the San Ron country, deep in southwestern Colorado. The Bruneau Treaty of 1873 forced the Native American Utes out of the area and allowed thousands of miners to flock in the following year. In they came. Silverton on the Animus River, Uray on the Uncompagre, Telluride on the San Miguel, and Lake City on the Lake Fork of the Gunnison. The great anthropologist Theodore Kreiber, who wrote the great book Ishi, the last surviving Digger Indian in California, and who had grown up near Telluride, reminisced about the area in the 1950s when she returned with the great historian David Lavender who had also grown up there. And here's what she said about the San Miguel Valley. And we could say it about the East River Valley or the Roaring Fork Valley or the Animus River Valley. She said this, in that thin dry air, life moved at a pace of almost terrible intensity. There were no neutral moments. The galloping brevity of spring and summer, the long months of winter, with the threat of tragedy always hovering high. Colors were high, the reds in the soil, the fall gold of the aspen, the indescribable sky. Riding in summer and tobogganing in winter were beyond the human norm. The heights of the mountains and the depths of the canyon meant one went about totally sensitized. No wonder a recovery for the elders was a trip to the coast and for a youngster introversion. Get on your horse and ride until you looked out and down, tremendously out and down. God was a pagan God, in the air, over the mountains, in the waterfalls. But how can I give the feeling tone of my childhood in that high alpine valley, which simply is one of the most beautiful spots in the world? Amen. Lake City was the first to boom in the San Juan. 1874, next to Lake San Cristobal, the second largest natural body of water in Colorado, caused by the slum gully and slide, which came down around 1300. And there is Lake City around 1880. Lake City had great mines like the Ute Ule and the Golden Fleece. And it was there that the saga of Alfred Packer played out in 1874. And we all know the story of the Colorado cannibal, Alfred Packer, which reminds me of Robert Service's great poem, 
Strange things are done neath the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. Sounds a lot like Packer. Not far away to the Southwest, over 13,000 foot high, nearly 13,000 foot high engineer and cinnamon passes, the great mining camp of Silverton sprang up near the headwaters of the Animus. It was where Charlie Baker and his party had planned Placer Gold in 1860. The original name of Baker's Park changed in 1874 when miner Jim Kendall came down from the mountains and exclaimed, hell, he said, we got silver by the ton. And there's Silverton with the Animus River going into the canyon in the background. Silverton was connected to Durango by the Denver and Rio Grande Narrow Gauge Railroad in 1882. And today, 200,000 people a year ride that 45-mile run through the Animus River Canyon on the Durango and Silverton train. It became known as the, the camp that never quit. And the Great Mines turned out $250 million worth of ore worth about 10 billion by today's prices. The mines did not shut down until 1991 when the Mayflower Mill and Standard Metals closed. In its history, Silverton produced 341,000 ounces of gold, 49 million ounces of silver, and 34,000 tons of lead, zinc, and copper, one of the great mining camps in history. In 1918, the Spanish flu killed 10% of Silverton's residents, 12 times the state average, and the highest percent of any town in the nation. Across Red Mountain Pass, 23 miles away to the north in Silverton, was another great mining town, Uray. Located on the Uncompagre River, Uray has been called the Opal of the Mountains, the Queen City of the San Juan the Switzerland of America, because of its tremendous canyons and waterfalls, red sandstone cliffs, 14,000 foot mountains which surround it, and incredible beauty. Highway 550, which goes from Uray to Silverton, is called the Million Dollar Highway and was built by Pathfinder Otto Mears in 1884. And it was called the Million Dollar Highway because they figured for every mile they built, they covered up $1 million worth of ore underneath the roadbed. The great gold and silver mines around Uray were the Wheel of Fortune and the famous Camp Bird, located seven miles up Canyon Creek, which turned out 70 million in ore alone. Uray also had the great solid Muldoon newspaper owned by the legendary David Day. Only 18 miles from Uray, was the final great mining camp of the San Juan, and that was Telluride. Getting there, however, was another matter because the highest and the most dangerous pa passes in Colorado and the nation separated the two towns. Black Bear Pass, 13,000 feet, and Imogene Pass, 13,184. There's the toll gate on the Red Mountain Pass toll road between Uray and Silverton. Above Telluride, near the head of the San Miguel River, was spectacular Bridal Veil Falls, plummeting 365 feet into the river. Telluride had 57 trams, which carried ore from mines high up to mills down below. In 1891, just outside of Telluride, at a little mining camp called Ames, Something of world importance occurred as Louis Nunn, who owned the old Gold King mine at 12,500 feet, looked for a cheaper way of power. What he did, along with his brother Paul Nunn and George Westinghouse and a guy named Nikola Tesla, was come up with a cheaper form of power called alternating current. And we're gonna talk about that in my water lecture. Alternating current could be run long distances. DC current cannot. The great mines were the Tomboy, the Black Bear and the Liberty Bell. 
In the 1930s, the Idorado Company, IDA for Idaho, RADO for Colorado, consolidated all the mines. And mining went on in Telluride to 1978. Another mining camp opened up, this time on the eastern slope, 52 miles from Lake City, called Creed, along the headwaters of the Rio Grande. A great silver camp, which unfortunately locate, was located four years before the Silver Panic of 1893. It was there that Cy Warmer to the Creed Candle said this, it's day all day in the daytime, but there is no night in Creed. And finally, we come to the last, the most unique, and the greatest gold area in Colorado and the West, and the second in the world behind South Africa, which began in 1890 in the shadows of Pikes Peak, about 20 miles west of Colorado Springs, and at 9,500 feet into the clouds. And that was the great camp of Cripple Creek Victor. Without any ravines, it was an unlikely area to have any gold. An early mining engineer said, if any of my men were looking for gold there, I would have fired them. However, the gold was deep in the bowels of the earth, in an extinct volcano, making Cripple Creek the only precious metal mining area outside of the Colorado Mineral Belt. Ashley, go to number 25. There is a great shot of Cripple Creek and Bennett Avenue. Cripple Creek and Victor are six miles apart. Victor is where the mines were, the city of mines. Cripple Creek with two stock exchanges was the financial area. Cowboy Bob Womack found the first traces of gold there in the 1870s along a creek where his cows often got crippled up crossing it. But Womack was an alcoholic and nobody believed the stories of gold. Then in 1899, a Terry Hode, Indiana carpenter who had been coming to the Cripple Creek area for over a decade, found an incredibly rich mine on Battle Mountain outside of Victor on the 4th of July. He named it the Independence and his name is Winfield Stratton. This began a great mining boom with the Portland, the Crescent, and the Vindicators, great mines. Thayer Tut, Speck Penrose, William Palmer, and James Hagerman as investors. And there you got guys working in the mines of Cripple Creek, probably a thousand feet down. Three railroads ran to Cripple Creek. Two electric lines took men to the mines from their homes. In the mid 1890s, 50,000 people swarmed into the area and into satellite camps like Elkton and Anaconda and Midway and Gillette and Goldfield. Cripple Creek was now the second greatest gold area in the world, turning out 20 million a year. When it shut down temporarily in 1944, it would revive again in 2000, mining dumps with better methods of recovery and open pit mining. Today, the Crescent Mine is still operating turning out $400 million worth of gold a year. In its history, by today's prices, Cripple Creek has turned out $35 billion worth of gold. The precious metal mines in Colorado were very important. They brought the first big population into the state. Pikes Peak was the place to be. They provided great wealth for Colorado bringing in railroads, investors, and smelters. It was also very destructive, leaving Colorado with an environmental mess that we have today. And it also left Colorado with great folklore or philology. Precious metal mining got most of the publicity in Colorado, but the state became the most versatile mining area in the nation with coal, molybdenum, granite, marble, uranium, copper, lead, and zinc, all mined. Many of the great mining towns are ski and tourist towns today. Breckenridge, Aspen, Crested Butte, Telluride, and Monarch. But great memories of the past remain. And there it is, the great mining frontier of Colorado. And now 
I went over a few minutes by this. Sorry about that. We'll go to Ashley, who's going to tell you again how to answer the trivia question. And then I'm going to give it to you. First come, first serve, and you'll get a book. So Ashley, fill them in. OK, so tonight, if everybody could put their answers in the chat box, um, and then I will do my best to scroll up to see who had answered it. And that's it. All right, I'm about ready to give the trivia question. Now, after I give that, if there are any questions or comments, feel free to get on the chat box. So here we go with the trivia question. First come, first serve. I want the name of the metal that produced more money than any other in Leadville's history, and that was $6 billion. Silver, or wait. Who got Molly? Okay, someone said molybdenum, but I need to sc scroll Who up. Who was the first one? Okay, so Catherine. No, Catherine White didn't get it. It may have been Frank Minson. He was wait. on early. Nope. So on my end at 758, Catherine Kell something. So I can't see it. Uh, she said molybdenum. Okay. So Catherine, you are going to uh, give Ashley your mailing address. I'm going to send the book out to you. Yeah. If you could just email me at curator at crestedbuttemuseum.com, Catherine, um, I can send that stuff to you. Good job on the molybdenum and they're still producing today. Are there any questions that anybody has or any comments that anybody has? We'd be happy to hear them. And I'll try to answer if there are any questions. So Come we on, do have one question in the question and answer box um, from Mark Walker. Yeah. Dwayne, why did Silverton have such a high death rate due to the Spanish flu? Mark Walker. They had a high death rate, Mark, because there, it was isolated primarily. And in the winter, it was very difficult to get in and out. Uh, now, the train ran, but a lot of times the train didn't run. So it was the isolation primarily. And, of course, they didn't have any vaccine at that time. Um, another question is from Cindy Jenkins. Uh, what was the disease that killed so many? The Spanish flu of 1918 and 1919, which killed 670,000 people out of a population of 100 million. That would be about 2.3 million people today if we had the same deaths. And then the next question is, hold on, my computer is being funny. Tempe's got one. Did Cripple oh, Creek have any mining disasters? And uh, the answer to that, Tempe, is uh, uh, no, not any more than usual. You know, they had, they had a lot of deep mining, but uh, no big explosions uh, or anything like that that I know of. But a lot of individual miners got killed. Um, Erica asks, did they take sleighs over East Maroon Pass? Slaves? Sleighs, like S. -L oh, sleighs. Yeah. Yes, they did. And I've got a great article on East Maroon Pass that I did for the paper. But they didn't take sleighs with any ore. They just used passengers. But they did. They took them over East Maroon Pass, you bet. Okay. Is there any other questions? Oh, wait. Any other questions or comments, anybody? Oh, Speak Michelle Michelle asked in the QA box, what was mined near St. Elm? I'm assuming that's St. Elmo. Yeah, St. Elmo. Yeah, that, that was another silver camp primarily. But they also had a lot of side ores like lead, zinc, copper, and a little gold. But St. Elmo and Romley and Hancock were primarily silver and Alpine also on the east side of the divide. Oh, let's see. Kevin says, Dwayne, when I took astronomy at CU, I was told that during World War II that the US military heard that Hitler and the Nazis were pursuing a study of the sun. They built a solar observatory in the Alps. As a result, the US built a solar absorb observatory atop Climax. However, a few years later, this closed as a result of the mining dust disturbed that the viewing. Do you know anything about this? Unfortunately, Kevin, I do not, but I'm jotting it down. I'm going to find out. I've never heard that, but thanks for the information. And, oh, was there any copper mining in Colorado? 
You know, the copper uh, copper was a side ore, so there was some, but the great copper areas were around Salt Lake City, where Bingham Canyon is today. That's the number one open pit copper mine in the world. And then the other great copper mines were in Southern Arizona around Globe and Bisbee and that area. That was the great copper country. Now, you know, where I grew up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, I grew up in the copper and iron country and uh, we've got great copper mining that went on there also um kevin wait what did Kevin? bill greason says the mary murphy or van de diem yellow cake question mark I'm not sure what that's in reference to well uh, the, the mary murphy mine was in hancock and that was silver now, Yellow Cake, that was the Homestake mine up on uh, Marshall Pass, much later. Uh, Kevin says, I believe the shell of the observatory is still present at the top. Let me know. And then Karen's question is, did Tabor have mining interest in Ashcroft? Yes, he did. And uh, he had a stake in the Tam O'Shander mine and the Montezuma mine. And when you go over Pearl Pass, you're going to go right through uh, Montezuma Basin. So Tabor had a lot. And then, of course, Ashcroft was the first great camp, but the mines were a little closer to Aspen, so everybody moved to Aspen. Um, Cindy Jenkins says, tell me again the two highest passes in Colorado. Well, the two highest passes that you can drive over in Colorado are uh, Mosquito Pass, which is between Leadville and Fairplay at 13,284. And then the other one is Imogene Pass between Telluride and Uray at about 13,184. Now they got another pass that's a little higher than that. And I've been on top of it, but you can't, you can't drive across it. And that's Argentine Pass above Georgetown. And you overlook Keystone. It's just a 25 degree rubble slope on the other side but they ran the Argentine Central Railroad right to the top of Argentine Pass, if you can believe it. And that dead ended. That's what I said. Wow, I've been up there. I got a little town called Waldorf up there. Any other questions or comments, anybody? Feel free. Heath says, another great lecture. Thank you, Dwayne. Oh, wait, I just got a huge, I'm assuming this is, Cindy says the origins of Sunspot as a solar observatory date back to the sudden increased interest of solar physics to the U.S. military during the Second World War in 1940. The high altitude observatory was established in 1940 in Climax. Oh, thank you. And that's Steve Jenkins. Steve, I got your number. I'll be calling you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Cindy, for the comments. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? If we don't have any more questions or comments, I'm going to wrap this up. Yeah, Catherine, thank you very much. Hold on a second. Any more comments? Yeah, thanks, Cindy. Thanks for everybody for being on board. We really appreciate it. Uh, next week, we've got railroads and another book. And I guarantee you, uh, everybody better be thinking of railroad songs because that may be the trivia question. Mark, thanks very much. Any other comments you want, just uh, feel free. Sharon, yeah, thank you very much. Coos Bay, Steve Prefontaine. Thanks, Barb. Hi, Barb. Yeah, any other comments, put them on. Yeah, Kara, thank you very much from Maine, appreciate it. Hope Rich and Phyllis are on board. Oh, Krista, thank you. One of my great students of all time was tuning in tonight. You tell PJ that. Yeah, Jamie and Ray, thank you very much. Yeah, Michelle, thank you for so, so much for the kind comments. All right, Ashley, I think that we are about ready. Okay. So thanks well, everybody for being on board and I will see you next Thursday. Thanks, Rich, with the Railroads of Colorado. Thanks everybody. And we'll see you next week. And just a quick thank you again to our sponsors, Western, Color Western Colorado um, University Foundation and Bill Petras, as well as Bud Bush from Bluebird Realty.
Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Thank Natasha. All right, Ashley, over and Thanks, out. Wayne. Thank yep. you. Have a good night. You bet. You too. Bye.